The Lord be with you. And also with you. I extend a warm welcome to you all as we gather today on this gorgeous day outside. It's one of those days that I wish we could have a little service outside. The weather is so beautiful. It almost feels like Easter, but it's not yet. Uh, please take note of the announcements in the bulletin uh, as well as on the screen. Uh, did want to just highlight that it's hard to believe that it will be Easter in a couple of weeks, and if you would like to have Easter lily dedicated to someone, there are forms in the narthex that you could pick up and fill out. We have a couple of uh, announcements that uh, uh, would be made, and MG is right here, so let's start with him. I dress for spring. Uh, I'm sure I'll, when you pulled in this morning, you saw the yard looks a little bit shaggy. I did share with you three weeks ago that somebody had stolen our lawnmower and that we need to replace it. And we made a plea to the church uh, for some funding to do this without having to dip into the endowment fund. Well, I have good news and sad news. The good news is the mower will be delivered April 14th. Uh, we will have one temporary until that to get the yard back in shape, but the new one will be hit the 14th. That's the good news. The sad news, we had four people step up for a donation of about $500 to help toward the mower. This shows a very small lack of support for the church from his congregation. Uh, and that's very sad. So we will dip into the endowment fund, knowing that's going to decrease the value of it with the stock market nowadays, making it even less. So it's going to be damaging, but we have to do it. Uh, there is still time if you feel the desire to donate. We can do it any time to the office, and we can replenish those funds. But it's going to take everybody supporting their church to keep this place running. Uh, it can't be done with the endowment fund. We cannot rely on it anymore. And that's everybody's got in the habit of doing that, and we need to break that habit. So with that, we will get the yard back in shape, and we'll continue on with making it as beautiful as we can. Thank you. And we have a message from Barbara. <laughs> it's me again. Talk about helping your church. So far, 25 of you have turned in your survey. That leaves a whole lot more that haven't. So Beth and Marlene will be in fellowship after church with the paper copies if you need them. And if you have yours online, please fill it out. We can't go forward until we have this done. And I'm sure Jim, is, Jim and John are tired of being here every week, so we need an interim. So help us to move, to move forward. That's it. Who said we're tired of being here? Me, just now. Are you not listening? <laughs> I'm glad you didn't offer this because, say this because I was hoping to, to, to say this. I've never been in a situation where I asked the congregation, why didn't you bring your cat to church today? <laughs> your congregational assessment form. So please, uh, uh, please finish, fill, fill that out online or bring it in so that the church can get a sense of where this congregation is and where they're going in the future. Um, next Sunday is the first Sunday of April. It's hard to believe. And traditionally, we celebrate the Lord's Supper then. There is an old tradition in many uh, denominations where in preparation for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the pastor would go house to house to inquire to make sure that the people there understood the meaning of communion. And if they did understand it, then they were given a wooden token, which they could then redeem the following Sunday or whenever the communion was. Um, well, I don't think you, since there is no pastor, and I certainly don't have the time to go to everyone's houses this week, nevertheless, it is important for us to consider that which we come here for and what God does for us. So I invite you this coming week to prepare your hearts and minds to receive and celebrate the Lord's Supper. Let us now be called to worship. Would you join me in the call to worship? We are ambassadors for Christ. 
God has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. We gather as God's beloved family to worship God and offer our praise. Let us join our hearts in song and in prayer. Let us pray. Journey with us, O holy God, as we continue our way to the cross. Sharpen our focus that our attention may center more on you than ourselves. Lead us through the shadows of darkness and prepare our hearts that we might be a people of prayer, ready to perceive and respond to your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Please join as you're able, and we're in singing hymn 475, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. If we keep silent, our sin will flourish, and we will groan all day long. Therefore, let all who are faithful acknowledge our sin and hide our transgression no more. In faith and with courage, let us confess our sin to God. Let us pray. Holy, Holy God, God, we confess that we keep silent when we should speak. We see iniquity and the injustices of the world, yet are content not to call them out. We withhold kind words, yet are quick to speak in judgment. Forgive us, O God, direct the ways we should go, and help us to use our voices to spread your grace and truth. Amen. Happy are those whose sin is forgiven. Be glad and rejoice, for in Christ we are a new creation. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Gracious God, our way in the wilderness, guide us by your word through these 40 days and minister to us with your Holy Spirit so that we may be reformed, restored, and renewed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if Christ, or excuse me, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
There's always a challenge when you're going to read a passage of scripture that is so familiar that you could probably do it in your, with your eyes closed. Sometimes what's helpful is to use a different version that's slightly different so you can have to start to listen a little more closely. And that is what will happen this morning as I read from Luke's chapter, cha Luke chapter 15, a very familiar story, and I will read it from the message. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke. By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased, not pleased at all. They growled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling triggered this story. There was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a dis distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he had gone through all of his money, there was a bad famine all throughout that country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him in the fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry, he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to his servants, quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. At this time, the older son was out in the field. When the day's work was done, he came in. As he approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. Calling over one of the houseboys, he asked what was going on. He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecued beef, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stalked off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, look, how many years I've stayed here serving you never giving you one moment of grief. But have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? This son of yours, who has thrown away your money on prostitutes, shows up and you go all out with a feast. The father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time and we had to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead, and he's alive. He was lost, and he's found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Howard was good with numbers. 
It wasn't always that way. In elementary and middle school, he was getting C's and D's. But somewhere in high school, a light bulb turned on in his mind, and suddenly he began to see and understand math more clearly. He went to college and studied business and finance. It was there that he met his wife to be Laura. After college, he got a good job with an investment firm. So he and Laura were married and they set out to conquer the world. Two children later, they were living comfortably in a luxurious home with fine cars and sending their children to the best private school that money could buy. They were living on top of the world. Howard always wore a white shirt, usually a dress shirt with a tie. But even casually, he would wear a white sports shirt. There was something about wearing a crisp white shirt that gave him the feeling of being important. Then came the crash. The stock market plummeted and the real estate market collapsed. That's where all of his company's investments and money were invested in, and his included. Almost overnight, he lost everything. He lost his job, he lost his home, he lost his life savings, and he became angry. Angry at his boss for letting him go. Angry at the company for not planning better for situations like this. Angry at the bank for taking his home. And angry at God for, well, well, for everything. Then he began to take his anger out on everyone, including those he loved the most. He wasn't abusive or anything like that, but he withdrew from them emotionally and physically. He was like a ship without a rudder. He was truly a lost soul. Jim and his wife Pamela were driving through a decayed and t down on its luck neighborhood. When they noticed a taxi cab pull up in front of a small shut up church. As they watched, an extremely elderly lady got out of the cab on her way up, trying to negotiate up the steps to the door. She was dressed in her Sunday best, a pastel purple dress that had seen considerable wear. Concerned, the couple stopped to offer their assistance and helped her get up the stairs to find that the doors on the church were locked shut. It became apparent that this woman in the purple dress had gotten confused and had come to church on Saturday instead of Sunday. The couple offered to drive her home and found themselves in a neighborhood that was even more decrepit than the one where the church was located. On the way, the woman shared that she was 92 years old and had no family. Her only son had died years before. Although she was extremely poor, and frighteningly fragile, this woman had taken her precious dwindling money to get stressed in her Sunday best and pay for a cab to take her to church. What impressed the couple most was the woman's calm acceptance, her unshakable trust that everything would be all right. She believed with all her heart that God would provide for her. The woman in the purple, her best purple dress didn't know what would happen to her. But she did know that Jesus would walk with her wherever she went. The little girl with pink Velcro fastening sneakers scuffed her feet, shoe, worn shoes uh, back and forth while she waited. Her mommy was late again. She knew sometimes that mommy got busy, but she also knew that sometimes mommy just forgot. She forgot about time passing. She forgot about whom she had left her daughter in care of, 
that, with that day. She even forgot that she was a parent of a four-year-old girl who depended on her for everything. Even at her young age, the little girl knew with the pink slippers already knew that it was the drugs and the drink that made mommy forget. They moved often. Mommy would often take the rent money and buy more drugs, and they would have to sneak out in the middle of the night. The little girl reached down to re-stick the Velcro strap on her left sneaker. Half the fuzzy little grippers were already worn and didn't work anymore, making the flap bounce back and forth and open and the sneaker fall off. That was probably why they were in the garbage where she found them in the first place. But at least they were a pretty color. The little girl sat quietly on her most recent neighbor's porch and wished mommy would remember where she was and that she needed mommy to take her home. Now, imagine a church a church in action. Its doors are as wide open as the world, and people are flowing in and out through its aisles without ceasing. David and Howard approach the entrance to the church and stop while David introduces Howard to some friends there. The two of them met in a restaurant several months ago. David was there to meet with the men's prayer breakfast group. When he happened to notice a a man looked in a, in a booth over in a corner looking rather despondent. And his heart went out to him, and so he went over and introduced himself and struck up a conversation. It turned out that each of them had faced financial ruin at some point in their lives, and they still struggled to juggle their new careers, family, and their own growth. David had found strength in the church. Howard felt alone and isolated. David had invited Howard to join him, join with the other people, because, he said, they are welcoming and affirming. You won't feel lost, he said. You'll feel found. The two of them now work together to provide garden plots where inner city people can grow produce. And once, when Howard showed up in, at the breakfast group wearing a white shirt and tie, nobody laughed. It sort of made them all feel a little bit special. Out in the parking lot, the church parking lot, Jim and Pamela are arriving with an elderly lady in a purple dress. Ever since that Sunday when the, they found the confused woman at the door of the church, they have been helping her with transportation and calling her to make sure that she's ready. They have taken her shopping and to the hairdresser. Later today, they're picking her up and taking her to a slide program at the senior center. Not that the couple hasn't gained anything in this relationship. The purple dress lady has taught them something about the certainty of God's love and provision. The three of them are always happy when they are together. And almost bumping into the couple is Tanya, an exuberant little girl. She's running ahead of, the fam of a family that has brought her to church, and she keeps calling for her mother to catch up with them. When she went to the doctor with an ear infection, the nurse sensed that the four-year-old and her mother were under a lot of stress. And after a few questions, the nurse knew that perhaps the church could help them out. Members provided food and clothing, and the family now walking with them introduced them to a couple of the deacons of the church who made arrangements for more assistance. It is to a meeting of these friends that the girl is now running, and in this gathering, she will be met with open arms. She came to thank the people there who replaced her worn pink sneakers with brand new sandals. Now the church that we've been imagining could be any church. Could be this church. 
where the love of God embraces everyone. This is a church where the focus is not so much on the lostness of people, but on the foundness. It's where the church, it is a church where the equivalent of robes and rings and sandals are worn by all of God's children, and where there is celebration for all of God's found ones. Now, every one of us knows what it likes to be lost at some point in our lives. That scary, confusing, out of control feeling that takes hold of your heart and grips it tight. For some of us, it's a feeling that is only temporary. When we're negotiating through an unknown city, trying to find our way, or when we go out to the parking lot at the shopping center and can't figure out where we left our car. But for many people, feeling lost is a much more permanent condition. And trying not to look lost is where their entire attention is focused. There is lostness in the life of the man in the white shirt and tie, the woman in the purple dress, and the girl in the pink sneakers. A lostness that is sometimes well camouflaged and kept under control. But not all people can wander out of their lostness and find help and assistance on their own. The man in the white shirt lost his job, his home, his savings, and he was on the verge of losing his family. He might look fine on the outside, like he's got it all together, but on the inside he's a hollow shell, a lonely, lost soul drowning in a raging sea. The woman in the purple dress has not lost her faith. It is her strongest support, her center of gravity, and it holds her secure. She has, however, been lost by a community of people who care and take care of her, who call on her. Where are the friends who keep her on track so that she knows what day it is? Who stops by to take her to church or to the store or to visit old friends? The little girl in the pink sneakers is the most obviously lost of all three because she is not alone in her lostness. Her father, who a long ago abandoned her and her mother for, to, in a prodigal search for pleasures of the world, was lost without a moral compass. Now the addictions that gra 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 grip her mother's body and soul have plunged both mother and daughter into a directionless void. The little girl has lost her innocent belief that mommy will always be there, that mommy will always take care of me. She knows that neither one of those statements is true. Her mother has lost control of her life, lost any vision of her for herself, and lost the chance to offer her child a hope for a better future. Even when they are together, they are lost, for each knows that the other is vulnerable and alone and fragile. No father and a mother who can't cope, this little girl is lost. Not lost like the prodigal son of the story that I read earlier, maybe more like the lamb that has gone astray. The parables of Jesus offer us a chance to recognize that the church is sort of like a worldwide lost and found, or maybe a hospital for the lost soul. It is the mission of the church to open our doors to all lost souls in this life. But here's the kicker. It's not just opening our doors. We must be willing to go out on the sidewalk, through the neighborhood, and up to closed doors, proclaiming the promise of forgiveness and extending embraces of grace, welcome, and acceptance. 
Paul tells the church in Corinth that he is an ambassador for God. Now recognize that an ambassador is a citizen of one country who is sent off to another country and speaks for that country. It's as if God were making his appeal through Paul as an apostle to the world. Paul saw himself as a detective specializing in missing persons. Come out of hiding, he says. Be reconciled to the Father who loves you. If Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, Paul believed that this mission was his as well and ours. How can it not be ours? We must seek out the lost and make God's appeal to them. We all know individuals who wear white dress shirts or purple dresses or pink tennis shoes. The question is, will we go out of our comfort zone to find them and share God's message with them? Are we content to be like the older son who lives at home and enjoys all of the comforts of home, but is never willing to go out and look for his lost brother? There is a world of lost people outside those doors. Are we willing to go find them? Let us pray. Holy God, may these, may these words find a place in our heart and stir us, recognizing that we too have been lost. We have been sheltered. We hide. But we have the good news of Jesus Christ. And that good news must be shared with all. Help us to open our hearts and our doors. In the name of Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us all. Amen. Please rise now and let us sing together Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound.
Let us affirm what we believe. <clears throat> what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Let us turn now to God in prayer and please respond to Lord in your mercy with the words, hear my, our prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, as we continue to contemplate the season of Lent, we are mindful of the lengths to which you would go for the love of humankind. We are floating on a sea of grace, greater than we can ask or imagine. As we gather in the name of Jesus Christ to pray, we are mindful that he taught us to pray for these things. We pray for this world, O oh God, which you have made and loved, and where you are at work for redemption. We pray for the leaders of the world, the leaders of other nations and our own. Your way in the world is one of wholeness and peace, and the world longs for your shalom. We pray in the midst of a war going on on the other side of the world, we pray for the refugees, those who have been driven out of their homes, those who see no future in returning. We pray for the children who one day were playing with their balls and laughing, who are now covering their ears from the sounds of missiles and bombs dropping in a world that they never knew existed for everything that they had has, is gone. We pray for the parents who struggle with their, the fact that their children will not have the, the peace and the joy that they had experienced. We pray for the families that have been separated, leaving behind loved ones whose future is unknown, but most likely will end in death. We pray for the countries to those area, in those areas where the refugees have fled as they open their arms. Open our hearts, O oh Lord, for we all are in pain at the suffering we see on our TV screens. O oh Lord, bring peace. Guide leaders to work for the common good of their own nations and for the whole world. Shorten the distances between us. Make us whole, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And likewise, we pray for the cities and neighborhoods where we live, for those in our midst who struggle with the strains of life, we offer our prayers. For those who live with unemployment and underemployment. For those who live without housing or substandard housing. For those who live with addiction and mental and emotional illness. For victims of violence. For all of these and for those unnamed yet known to you, we offer our prayers. You know the full measure of grace that is needed in each life. And so we commend our prayers to your care. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Finally, O oh God, we pray for ourselves. You have called each of us to live lives marked with your grace, sustained by your power to be a blessing to the world. We all need to be inspired and sustained. And so we give our thanks to you for the community of faith and the communities of faith that have guided and nurtured us throughout our lives. We give you thanks for this community of faith for its witness in the past, its witness in the present, and its witness in the future. We pray for the Church Universal and for the Presbyterian Church. May each of these be the mother of faith that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers, O Lord, as we pray the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Remembering that all that we have and all that we are is a gift from God entrusted to our care for but a season. Let us return to God a portion of what we have been so generously given with our tithes and our offerings and dedicate ourselves anew to God today. Let us pray. Holy God, you have given us abundance upon abundance, grace upon grace. We are grateful. Receive our gifts, bless them, multiply them, and use them that we might see your reign at work among us. Amen. Please stand as you're able. We're going to sing hymn 803, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need.
Now go out into the world. You are ambassadors for Christ, representing the kingdom of God to all. And may God bless you and keep you. May God be kind and gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.